going to. But anyways. All right. A student. All right. So hello. Welcome back to the weekend. I'm back from um, Cambridge. So what we're going to do, well, let's see what are the announcements. Um, first, the first homework assignment is due on Friday of this week. Okay? As I've said several times. So if it's changed to Friday instead of like the NGO Wednesday. Um, second, there is a second homework assignment, which would have been the one I would have given last week if I were here, which is also due on Friday over the material from last week. Okay, and I'll be handing that out here. Do this one. Yeah, let's do this Friday, because it's the homework that would have been assigned last week if I had been here to assign. So that's these problems. And there's a third homework assignment, to the one I am assigning, which is due next Friday. Friday. <laughs> 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 You'll see that uh, <laughs> each, one is, <laughs> each one is twice as long as the preceding ones. <laughs> but yeah, so that's the third homework assignment. So this Friday, what you have to do is the homework you already did, and then this new homework assignment, which is over the material from last week, which you should hopefully have got so much trouble with. Um, I think that, I think next week's homework assignment starts to get more challenging. I have a question on, on sure. this, the, this week's homework. Mm -hmm. The first this week homework. Yeah, um, don't just give a number though, because I can't remember which problems are which. Um, it just what is what is Z bar? Uh, um, okay. I guess Trevor didn't find it. You can find first. You can answer that by looking at the PDF book for the course, or anything like that's defined. Okay. But if you don't want to read um, the book, here's the definition. So it's a subset of a fixed choice of Q bar. You know, and by fixed choice of Q bar, so it's an algebraic closure of the rational numbers. One possible choice for a Q bar is you take um, the complex numbers and then take the subset of all roots of polynomials with coefficients in Q. So one possible choice for this QR is instead of all alpha in the complex numbers, so that f of alpha equals 0 for sum f of polynomial with coefficients in Q. So that's a particular QR, but there are other isomorphic versions of QR. Um, for example, you could take, um, well, you could consider, some. there's something like C that's PI, so you could take all roots in some PI field. You could also just sort of prove that Q bar, so I guess, exists without having to construct C. Uh, so, but you can view Q bar, for, for the purposes of this entire course, it's fine to just think of Q bar as being the set of all roots of polynomials with coefficients in Q. And then Z bar is a subset of that. It's a set of all elements uh, alpha in Q bar, such that f of alpha equals 0 for some f in the Z squared architects. So for some f that has, oh, that's monic, some monic f. I.e., it's a set of elements of Q bar once you fix the Q bar that are integral. So Z bar is, it's, it's, it's the ring of all algebraic integers. And last week, um, Trevor hopefully proved that this is a ring. The ring of all algebraic integers in a fixed choice of Q bar. that notation, but um, it's completely fine to in quotes think z is O sub Q bar. Though I, I didn't define O sub, well I didn't personally define this at OK at all, but um, OK uh, is the ring of algebraic integers in some field. Okay? So that's what z bar is. Basically z bar is really big. Um, is z bar possible? enumerate all the polynomials with integer coefficients, and therefore you can enumerate all of these roots. So it is countable. It's big, but it's countable. And is it Ethereum? No, because that's one of the number of problems. Not Ethereum. Okay, uh, it's 
the only way in which it's really not like OK where K is a number field um, is that it's not compared. Otherwise, Z bar is very much like this. OK. Uh, by the way, the first cryptography seminar is going to be this Wednesday's Wednesday, and it looks like it's going to be at um, 4.30. So, crypto seminar, 4.30 p.m., and I'll remind you on Wednesday. On Wednesday, it's going to be in the communications building, B027, so it's directly across the street from here. The speaker is, the first speaker is going to be Neil Koblitz, and he's going to talk about, uh, basically he wrote a uh, controversial paper that's in the latest issue of the notices about people who, about his perspective on provable security, and he's going to give a talk about, kind of, I guess, a, pre a practice version of a talk he's going to give at some big meeting on, um, on this. Actually, maybe he already gave it at a big meeting, but he's going to give a talk. It's controversial, right? Well, if you wanted it to be, I don't know if it turned out. But his expectation was that it would be controversial because he's really sort of insulting certain people. It definitely exists. Yeah, and it was written in response actually to people that he significantly pissed off, and um, I guess they they used all these biblical references to attack him, which I thought was kind of amusing. <laughs> so, anyways, come to this if you want an exciting fun first crypto seminar, and I think it's probably the first ever crypto seminar in the math department. So. Definitely come to help support it growing. Okay, so it's the crypto seminar. The number three seminar won't meet this week, and the safe seminar won't meet either, because we've been better acts together. Um, we may have Nike Dotsel, who's an amazing number theorist from Canada, speak next week. Probably he will. Um, okay, so those are all the seminars. All right, so we're going to start uh, with chapter three of the book right now. So make sure you've read through chapter two if you haven't already. And chapter three is about dedicated domains and unique factorization of ideals. <coughs> going into chapter three. Um, by the way, the plan for this week is to define dedicated domains to prove that the rings of integers and number fields are dedicated domains, establish the properties of dedicated domains, namely that every ideal in a dedicated, every non-zero ideal factors uniquely as a product of prime ideals. And then once we do that, um, I'll talk about how to use stage to do calculations related to this course on Friday. So I'm slightly rearranging the schedule, which said that I would talk about stage on Wednesday. So instead I'll talk about it on Friday. So that's what this week will be. So basically the first two days of this week are chapter three, and then the last day is computing the stage. Just looking to see if there's a, yeah, there's a little screen. Good. Okay, so. Chapter three, Dedicated Domains. Oh, one other announcement, sorry. Um, I will only be in my office at office hours on Thursday from 2 to 2.30 because there's a colloquium on um, Kazdan Litzik Polynomials at 2.30 that I have to go to because I'll be mentioned in a hopefully good way, but we'll see. Um, so only I'll be in my office tomorrow from 2 to 3, and then Thursday, 2 to 2.30. Okay, so Dedekind domain. So here's the definition. Um, so, you know, you've heard of integral domains, you've heard of fields, commutative rings, etc. This is just another definition like that. Um, it abstracts out some essential properties of the ring of integers of a number field, and you can prove a whole bunch of theorems about rings that have those properties. And there are examples of rings that have those properties that aren't the ring of integers of a number field. So it's kind of nice because you, you prove things about other interesting rings automatically. So here's the definition. A Dedekind domain is a, an integral domain that well, has three properties. This in the order. The Ethereum <coughs> integrally closed. So when it's an Ethereum. The second property I will define after stating it, it's integrally closed in its field of fractions.
finally, every prime ideal is maximal. And um, before I go further, really what this is trying to model is kind of an arithmetic analog, a not too complicated arithmetic analog of a smooth curve. Um, Ethereum, just so that things behave well, integrally closed dense field of fractions, that's kind of like smooth or regular. And um, I mean, smooth is, regular is really the better term because smooth is a relative position. But um, this is sort of like smooth or regular. And every prime ideal is maximal is like dimension one or actually less than or equal to one. So this is regular. And this is dimension less than or equal to one. Okay, so now the precise definitions. So, integrally closed in this field of fractions is calling an integral domain domain is integrally closed in its field of fractions. Define field of fractions. So if you have a ring R, an integral domain R, then the field of fractions, frac of R, is instead of all fractions A over B, where A and B are in R, B is not equal to zero, and you say that A over B is equivalent to C over D. Um, so it's really the equivalence classes of these questions, if and only if A, D is equal to B, C. So if you have any um, integral domain at all, it's just a field that the integral domain naturally sits inside. That's all. So that's what frac R is. That's a field of fractions. So an integral domain is integrally closed in its field of fractions if um, whenever alpha in the field of fractions satisfies polynomial f of x in r squared backwards x. Notice there's no constraint here that r be the integers. And this f doesn't have to have integer coefficients, just coefficients in r. Then alpha is actually in r. So that's what it means to be integrally closed in field fractions. And let's, um, our first thing we'll prove today, which is actually some work to prove, there's some interesting ideas. We're going to prove that Z bar is integrally closed in its field of factors to Q bar. That'll be the first interesting thing we show. By the way, before doing that, let's just write down a few examples on let's see. There's just some examples of fraction fields. It's kind of silly. Trivial, but um, Z is fraction field Q. Z so join uh, two times I. That's a ring. What is its fraction field? Where I is squared and minus one. So it's some field that naturally contains this and is isomorphic to all fractions like that. Q join I. Excellent. Q join I. And you, you could put Q join 2i here if you wanted, but one half is in Q, so you can always just get rid of that. So there's no point. Uh, let's see, what about um, FP, where P is a prime, so a finite field of order P. What is its field of fractions? Same, same just thing. itself. Um, let's see, what about Q square brackets X, polynomials in X over Q? Rational functions. Yep. Rational functions. Made in Q of x. And what about x? Um, what about formal power series in x over q? Formal power series? Mm -hmm. 
series. Okay, so there's lots of rings and corresponding fields of functions. Okay, and now let's, now let's start looking at this. So integrally closed in the field of fractions. So here's the first um, statement, which is proposition 313 in the notes. Proposition uh, Z bar is integrally closed in its field of fractions. And once we prove this, it will be trivial to deduce that O sub k for any k is integrally closed. We just intersect k with z bar, and you get O sub k. And you, well, it'll be easy to see. I'll show you in a minute. So let's prove this. So what we have to do is take an element alpha in q bar, <coughs> suppose that it satisfies a polynomial that's monic and has coefficients in z bar, and then show that that element had to actually be in z bar via some trick. So suppose alpha in q bar and f of alpha equals zero with f of x in z bar square brackets x. Monic. So our goal is to show that alpha is in z bar. And uh, I hope Trevor proved last week that an, uh, element, of, an, an element of q bar is um, in z bar, right? It's integral if and only if the modulate or the, the ring it generates over z is finitely generated as a z module. So um, recall alpha is in z bar if and only if z adjoint alpha is finitely generated as a z module. It's obviously finitely generated as a ring. Trivially it's just generated by alpha, but as a z module. So an example of this sort of thing is you take i, you take the square root minus 1 and adjoin it to z, the ring you get it is the Gaussian integers, which just happens to be finitely generated as a z module, it's a ring 2. Whereas what would happen if you take, say, z adjoin i divided by 2, is the result finitely generated as a z module? No, because um, it isn't. I mean, it basically what happens is you can get larger and larger denominators here and, and see that this can't possibly be finitely generated. Um, well, that's, that's really from last week, so I'll go into much more about it. But this is the criterion we're going to use. So we need to show that this alpha generates something that's finite. So here's how we do it. You just take f and you look at it. see that it looks like this. So f of x is for some n it's x to the n because it's monic plus a n minus 1 x to the n minus 1 plus dot 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 plus a 1 x plus a 0. And without loss we can assume that f is the polynomial of least degree with this property and that polynomial will be irreducible. Um, I guess we don't really need that. but. Yeah, we don't need that anyways. All you need is that you have this. So, so we have this polynomial in z bar square brackets x, which means that each of the a i are in z bar. And now, let's just use the relation. So note that 0 is equal to f of alpha because alpha satisfies f. And just writing out what that says, it says you can express alpha to the n in terms of these other things. So alpha to the n plus a n minus 1 alpha to the n minus 1 is dot dot plus a1 alpha plus a0. This is equal to 0. So if you imagine, say, you actually want to write things down and compute with the ring z adjoint alpha. 
maybe don't have a handle in yet. Well, if you got up to alpha to the n, you could replace it by the negative of this submatrix. Unfortunately, that would not make sense in z square vector alpha, because it could easily be the case that the, these ai's aren't in there. So watch out. So you can't just do what I said. You have to be a little more careful. Um, otherwise, you could just sort of quickly get that it's finally generated. So what you have to do is the following. Consider z adjoin a 0 up through a n minus 1. So this ring is finitely generated because it's contained in the ring of integers of the number field k, where k is q join a 0 up through a n minus 1. So um, just to join all the other coefficients, that's finitely many things of finite degree. So you get a number field, so number field. And inside of that number field, you have the ring of integers, O sub k. You already know that the ring of integers in a number field is finitely generated. That was we, last week, I hope that Trevor McBitty proved that OK is an Ethereum. Yeah, he proved it by, um, let's see. So he just observed that it, uh, Actually, how do you prove? You guys are here, so how do you prove that OK is an Ethereum? Should it use a free Boolean group? Sure. Okay, so free Boolean group. What else? Finite rank. rank. How do you show this finite rank? So, um, okay. want to add anything? Okay. so this is an Ethereum, something from last week. And I appreciate what you learned by thinking, what did I learn? It's an Ethereum. And I mean, really, one of the key things was the also the Hilbert basis theorem, which tells you that um, any finitely generated module over or any finitely generated ring over z is itself an Ethereum, right? So really, all you need to show this as an Ethereum is that it's finitely generated over z. And um, why is that? Why is it finitely generated over z? Mm. It's actually finitely generated as a module already. So. Alternatively, you can take, I mean, one way to sort of really quickly just see why this is true, if you take a, a primitive element, well, let's see, I'm going to show this in circular. Okay, so this is, this is why, this is from last week. So this is contained in OK. OK is, um, as everybody is saying, so I'll just assume it. Finally, it's uh, over Z, it's a finite ring. So as a Z module, this subring is also a finite ring because a submodule of a Z module, a finite ring, is a finite ring. And therefore, this is a um, finite ring. And now, if you consider the um, ring Z adjoin A0 up through A n minus 1, adjoin alpha. This is, <clears throat> well, if you think about it, you can express any element in here as some, you know, imagine some huge expression in here. You can always reduce any power of alpha that's alpha to the n or greater in terms of lower powers of alpha. So you can just using this relation right here, this is equal to zero, write any element of this ring as 
alpha to the n minus 1 times something in here, plus alpha to the n minus 2 times something in here, and so on down. So the fact that this is finitely generated, and that you can write everything in terms of uh, only the powers of alpha up to alpha to the n minus 1, means that this is finitely generated as a Z module. Because literally, you could just take a basis for Z doing A0 up through AN minus 1, and then multiply each of those basis elements by all powers of alpha up to alpha to the n minus 1, and they would span this. So this is definitely finally generated as a Z module, which means that Z alpha, which is contained in there, is itself finally generated as a Z module. So this is finally generated because it's a submodule of, of a Z module that's finally generated, which is exactly what we wanted to show. It tells us that alpha is integral, it's in Z bar. So we showed this because we showed that Z of alpha is finally generated. So the trick was simply, I mean, the obvious thing that you'd want to do is just write all powers of alpha that are n and bigger in terms of lower things. You can't do that because the a sub i's here are in Z bar, not in Z. But all you have to do is just work over Z bar, note that you're getting something finally generated over that, and that that has to be finally generated over Z. That's where the sort of trick is. And then your Z alpha is just contained in this thing that's finally generated over Z. Therefore, it's finally generated over Z. OK, so that proves the proposition. And now as a quick corollary, let's prove that um, OK is also integrally closed. For any number field K, in its field of fractions, which is K. So proof. So, I mean, it's really pretty easy. By embedding K into Q bar, <coughs> just take such an embedding like this, then you're OK under that thing that's embedded into Z bar, and um, now if you take, you take an alpha in K that is, int that is integral, then alpha under this embedding is in Z bar by what we just proved. We proved that anything that's integral over um, Z bar is actually contained in Z bar. And if it's integral over OK, so it satisfies a monic, irreduced, well, some monic polynomial with coefficients in OK, hence it certainly satisfies a monic polynomial with coefficients in Z bar, hence it's in Z bar, and alpha's in Z bar. Um, but OK is just equal to, under this uh, identification to K intersects Z bar. Z bar is the set of all integral elements, OK is the set of all integral elements that are in K. So that's the intersection. So that tells us, so alpha is in, um, so it's certainly in K, and it's also in Z bar, it's in OK, which proves that OK is integrally closed. So just to, to connect with geometry, because I know a lot of people are algebraic geometers here, uh, really what, ha what this ring of integers is like is it's like a, uh, it's like a normalization, sort of, of, a, of something that's not nice and smooth, or nice and regular. So you might, you have k, you might imagine starting with something inside of it that sort of approximates the ring of integers. So for example, take q adjoin root 5, and then start with something such as z adjoin square root 5. And um, if you like to think geometrically about these objects, you could consider the corresponding scheme spec of z adjoin square root 5. So, um, how many people here have heard of the spectrum of a commutative ring? So about half of you. All it is, is it's the set of prime ideals in a commutative ring. That's it. You just take the set of all prime ideals in the ring, that's the spectrum. One extra thing, one of the extra things actually, is it, it's, you can view it as a topological space. 
with something called the Zariski topology. And then there's another extra thing, which is that it has a, a sheet. Um, it's a locally reamed space. So you can consider the spectrum here. And then um, z adjoint square root of 5 is contained in the ring of integers z plus z adjoint 1 plus root of 5 over 2. Um, this is actually, this is OK right here. Um, <coughs> where k is q adjoint root 5. And this is somehow non-singular, or sorry, this is somehow singular, and this is not up here. So this is sort of interesting. Maybe it's, it's like that. So, um, so going from some random order, as it's called, there's a subring of the ring of integers, a finite index, to the full ring of integers is like normalized, just to give you some like geometric thing to think about in the back of your mind. Uh, that said, if you view everything as mapping to z, or really spec of z, no matter what you do, this map isn't smooth in a precise sense. Um, and I'll, I'll say more about that later in about, I think, a week or two, when we talk about an algorithm for factoring primes. Sounds kind of ridiculous, but um, there's a notion in which you want to factor primes. Okay, so on to our next thing. So we only proved one thing today. We only proved more than one thing. Um, okay, let's prove that O sub k is a Dedekind domain. So again, quickly resummarizing what it means to be a Dedekind domain. Dedekind domain means no theory. Three properties of theory. Integrally closed, and every prime is maximal. So let's prove that O sub k is a Dedekind domain. First, what about Neutherian? Well, we just talked about that. We all believe O sub k is Neutherian, dead. So just check that off the list. Don't worry about that anymore. Intricately closed. That's what we just proved. It's, it is, in fact, intricately closed. If there was something in it, if there was something in k, it was integral over OK. You can use the construction I just wrote down to prove that it actually is in OK. Finally, what about every prime ideal being maximal? Ugh. So how are you going to show that? Um, so this is the thing we haven't done yet. So this is the one thing we have to prove. So let's take um, one example before we dive into the proof. Um, is there a question or comment? No, I know. Yeah, no, question. no? I know how to prove it. Oh. But no, exactly. Right. Most of you should know how to prove it because you read the book before class, right? <laughs> um, anyways, example take Z. Think about the um, prime ideals in the integers. Well, Z is a PID, and the prime ideals are, there's the zero ideal, which is prime, because we quotient the integers out, right, and get an integral domain. That's the definition of prime. Um, you just get Z again. And then for each prime number P, so 2, 3, 5, and so on, you have the principal ideal generated by that prime number, of the dot, and those are the other prime ideals. So, question, is every prime ideal, uh, well, actually, that's wrong ways to do it. Every non-zero prime ideal is maximal. Oops. Sorry about that. Uh, because here is a prime ideal that is not maximal. But it's zero, so we're okay. However, these guys, two, three, five, and so on, they're they are um, they're non-zero and prime, and they're maximal because when you quotient z out by the ideal generated by p, you get a field, the field fp if you like. In the field. Hence, these are maximal. So now all you have to do is prove something just like this in the case of uh, an arbitrary O sub k. One way we could approach it would be to try to write down in some explicit way every single um, prime ideal in an OK 
And that's actually not so easy to do. One thing we will prove, by the way, later in the course is that if you have any um, ideal at all in the ring of integers OK of a number field, it's generated by at most two elements, which is kind of interesting. It'll be an application of something we do. Uh, where if you, if you consider instead orders, so something like this, that's not the full ring of integers, then it might be generated by three or four. The minimal number of generators of an ideal could be arbitrarily large for these orders. But for the full ring of integers, it's always at most two. OK, so um, you could kind of write them down that way. But um, let's not do that. OK, so let's prove the, the theorem. So take a prime ideal P in OK prime ideal. And let's show that this thing is maximal. OK, so all you have to do is um, use that it's non zero. <coughs> so the most obvious way to use that it's non zero is to say let a and p be a non zero element of p. You can only do that using that it's non zero. OK, and now um, the next thing we're going to do is uh, consider the, the minimal polynomial of A, that f of x is in z square brackets x, the mnemonic minimal polynomial, so the mnemonic polynomial of least degree that has a property that f of A equals 0, and f is non-zero, the mnemonic um, polynomial, minimal polynomial Now all we have to do is somehow use this to show that P is a maximal ideal, which we will do. do. Do we know that if we pick an ideal of OK, then the index is finite? Um, that's what I'm going to prove right now. Oh, okay. So we don't know that yet, but we can prove it. And the proof is it's pretty straightforward. So watch this. It's really just a funny little trick. Um, so f of a is 0. So if you're just writing f of x as um, x to the n plus b n minus 1 x to the n minus 1 plus dot 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 plus b1 x plus b0 and zx, then on the first nice observation is that b0 is non-zero. Because if it were 0, this polynomial would be reducible. So this is not equal to 0. So now just notice, it's almost the same trick as last time, or at least Kind of the same approach. I said there's more to it. But 0 is equal to f of a, which is equal to a to the n plus e n minus 1, a to the n minus 1, plus dot 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 plus uh, b1 a plus b0. That's 0. And that means that uh, this quantity right here, a n plus dot 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 plus b1 a, is equal to minus b0. Now, here's the cool thing this quantity on the left is in our ideal because of the definition of ideal. Uh, it's just a is in the ideal, and you're taking powers and you know, multiplying and taking a sum. This is definitely in our ideal p, which means that this integer right here, this non-zero integer, is in the ideal p. OK, now we're home free. So conclusion, conclusion, p contains the non-zero integer E zero. This means that so OK mod P is OK modulo. You could just question out by B zero first. And then we could question that out by the image of P and OK mod B, B zero OK. Maybe that's actually that's too complicated. There's a much easier way to see what I'm going to do. So OK mod P is uh, killed by B0. B0, this non-zero integer acts as 0 on this. If you multiply any element here by B0, you get 0. On the other hand, this is a um, quotient of a finitely generated abelian group. So it's a finitely generated abelian group killed by a non-zero integer. That makes it a finite group. So OK is killed by B0 and is 
they finitely generated the Boolean proof. And so it's finite. Hence, if I push it, OK mod P is finite. On the other hand, P is a prime ideal by hypothesis. I just took a prime ideal, non, uh, right there, a prime ideal. That means that OK mod P is an integral domain. It's just the definition of prime ideal. And so OK mod P is a finite integral domain. And one of the funnest things you prove is that every finite integral domain is a field. In fact, that's one of the homework problems. Finite integral domain. That's, it's a field. So OK mod P is a field. That uh, P is maximum. So we just proved that O sub K is, in, is um, a dedicated domain. I have a question. Sure. And this so is killed by B0. Yes. But if B0 is in P, doesn't that just mean that we've multiplied by 0? Um, it's killed. Well, all I mean is imagine this as some abstract abelian group. The whole thing, OK mod P. Yeah. And here's an observation. If you take any element of that abstract abelian group, like any element C, if I multiply it by B0, what do I get? I definitely get something, as you're saying, that's in P. So I get something that's 0 in the quotient. Yeah. That means that any element of this finite abelian group, if you add it to itself B0 times, B0 is just an integer, you end up getting 0 again. Oh, so, B0 is Yeah, so is think about this like a, in terms of the structure theorem. This is a product of copies of z mod n to the z's for various n's, plus some torsion, or tor plus some torsion free parts and copies of z. But you can't have any copies of z, because they're not killed by b0. OK, crystal clear? Yeah. Last step? Sure. Good. OK, so we've now proved the theorem, the proposition that OK is a Dedekind domain. There are actually a lot of Dedekind domains out there. Um, but OK is one of them. And um, yeah, so. So I'm going to write down various examples of rings. And what you're going to do is try to guess or wh whatever um, whether or not they're a Dedekind domain. Okay. So one example you have of a Dedekind domain is the ring of integers of a number of you. Now I have a humongous list of, of rings. We'll see which ones are and are not Dedekind domains. Okay. 
Um, what about take a finite field Fp and join x? Is that a definite domain? This way? Or even better yet, take any field at all, k and join x. If you did that, you think it's a dedicated domain or not. Yeah, just like with q, the argument works the same. So it is, in fact, a dedicated domain. So is, is any PID a dedicated domain? That's a good question. Here's my next example of a PID. Fp join x mod x squared. It's not a dedicated domain. Well, actually, it's not a PID, because it's not a domain. No. Um, no. Okay, let's see. Is any PID a dedicated domain? Um, um, um. Okay, the value of zero prime being maximal should work. Uh, principal ideal is prime. Okay. It's an Ethereum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's definitely an Ethereum. Um, well, nearly close is going to be a problem, isn't it? Yeah, so uh, can you make a PID that can you can you actually make a PID that's not in your But it's UFD. What? But it's a UFD. It's a UFD. Interpolate close. Yeah, but it's not in your place. Um, maybe. It is. Um, yeah. 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 Well, let's see, for UFD language. Well, we don't know other properties. I'll just write these down. Um, okay, here's one. What about ZP, the ring of chaotic integers? Is that a um, dedicated domain? Yeah, you have to use it because you have like lots of primes going down. Yeah, so I guess it wouldn't really have to be it. Polynomials and two variables, isn't that? There's some theorem that says like oh, if so if it's U F D then that is equivalent to something equivalent to should be equivalent. Yeah, yeah. So U F D isn't. Yeah, this is yeah, ZP is. Okay, Z P is yes, it is a dedicated domain. Because it's a completion of a dedicated domain, which makes it it's also a PID. And, yeah, it's a PID of terms. That's why it's, it's huge, it's uncountable, but it's still an Ethereum because every ideal is principal in ZP. And Ethereum for a ring means every ideal is finally generated. So that's good. Um, okay, what about ZP double brackets X? Is that a dedicated domain? It's not a PID. That doesn't mean it's not a dedicated domain. <laughs> <laughs> so is this a dedicated domain? Hmm? Um, That's not the field. What? It's not the field. It's not no, Ethereum? No, no, no. Oh, no Ethereum. Uh, I think it is, yeah. Yes. It's at most by two things, too. So, is it a dedicated domain? What about some of the other properties? Like, uh, what about the, every non zero primary deals maximal? So, oh, I think, no, no, isn't no. P a primary deal? Ideal joint by P? Yeah, just X. X is a primary Or X, deal. yeah, X. Uh, the ideal joint by X is a prime ideal. And if you question out by that, you get ZP, yeah, which, which is not a field. Yeah. So it fails to be, has dimension 2. Uh, sorry, I shouldn't say that. It's not. Has cool dimension too, um, so it's not a um, dedicated domain. Okay, here's another one. So from Z join two I. Consider that as an abstract ring, which you could think of as abstractly a Z join X modulo X squared plus four. Is that a dedicated domain? It's not integrally closed. Okay, so what's, it's not integrally closed. Yes. So it's integral closure in the CHRI. 
Great. It's integral closure to each on A. In particular, I, which satisfies the polynomial x squared plus 1, is in the fraction field of this, but not in this. Therefore, this is not in the pathetic domain. Okay, so the last thing I'll say before we end is that the theorem that if you take any Dedekind domain at all, so anything where it was just here, then the um, uh, I think that to define fractional ideals, but um, the set of ideals, well, actually I can do this. There are every ideal, every single non-zero ideal factors uniquely as a product of prime ideals. as a product of prime ideals. This is for any <coughs> Dedekind domain at all. So, or any Dedekind domain. Every non-zero ideal factors uniquely as a product of prime ideals. So Dedekind domains are awesome because they remedy the fact that for rings of integers, you very often don't have unique factorization. But you do have unique factorization for the ideals, just not for the elements. <coughs> okay. And it's just a nice concept because it actually applies in a lot of different cases. It's also true that every ideal of Q join X factors uniquely as a product of X. Every ideal of ZP does. So not too exciting. But, um, and I mean, this is a really interesting one where you take this. You can also take the ring of you can take the field of rational functions on an algebraic curve over a kind of field, and inside of that you can find a, a ring that looks like OK, and that will have be a Dedekind domain and have this property. So um, this sort of thing also comes up in algebraic geometry. OK, so I'll see you on Wednesday.